The next person is Dr. Abel Speed, who uh, I wanted her to come in particular because she is my breast surgeon. Um, when I was going through my ordeal, she studied at Morehouse Medical School, uh, Morehouse School of Medicine, did her internship and residency at Grady Hospital, and then she went on to do uh, to become a Coleman um, Scholar Fellow at MD Anderson in Houston. So Abel Speed, if you would come to the podium to present to us, thank you. Well, nonetheless, yes, okay. I, I hate being restricted to the microphone because I walk around a lot. Is that okay? All right, so uh, nonetheless, my name is uh, Dr. Speed. I had the privilege of having, um, yes. Sorry, we do need you to stand kind of close. Okay. There's a lot of people that are actually trying to get that audio, if you don't mind. Not at all. So we can spread your word elsewhere. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Nonetheless, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Speed, and I want to thank uh, Madam Chair for the privilege of the podium today. Uh, I had the privilege of having her as a patient, um, but I just want to say that I feel like I have a, a front row seat to the best show on earth. And that show is that I have come across some of the most brilliant people in this room today that are on the forefront of history, and it gives me great pleasure to just be invited to be a part of that. And so I want you guys to be very proud of yourselves for being here. I'm sure I don't have to convince those that are sitting here the importance of being on the right side of history by being here today. Um, all of what we all need to try to enforce this agenda, I say, is already inside each and every one of us. I say what we learned as children will help us navigate life. And I use it where you stop, look, go. And what that is, is when you were learning to cross the street as a child, what were you told to do? To do three things. One, but before you look both ways, what you do? Stop. Yeah, so you stop, and then you do what? Look, and then you what? Go. Absolutely. So you stop, look, and then you go. And I think with this medical marijuana initiative, we can take a similar approach, where what we're doing today is we're stopping. We're taking a pause to have a conversation. And I think change starts with having a conversation so that we can better understand this agenda, better understand its usefulness in all of our lives, not just the lives of cancer patients, but everyday um, Americans that can benefit from the utility of having medical marijuana available. So when you stop, we're taking a pause. So I'm hoping you all will speak to each other and also speak to your constituents and whatever platform you have to help further educate. The next thing you do after stopping, we're pausing, we're doing that today, is to make sure you do what? Look both ways. And oftentimes, looking both ways is to avoid obstacles, right? And so when you're crossing the street, what are some of the obstacles? Cars, trucks, et cetera. But I think with medicinal marijuana, those obstacles, obstacles can be legal obstacles, that those obstacles can be miseducation or undereducation regarding the utility or usefulness of medicinal marijuana. But all of those things, we still have to get to the other side of the street. We've got to get to the other side of this issue. So I don't want us to be inhibited by the obstacles. There's ways in which to navigate that, and that's through education, documented research, having advocates, I think, like some of the smartest people in this room I've had the opportunity to just have casual conversations with that can be a huge impact on this agenda. Again, not allowing these obstacles to prevent us from getting to the other side. And so once you get to the other side or before you go, what were you often doing before you crossed the street? You're with your family, you're with your friend, you do what? What's that? You hold hands and you take someone with you. So it's very important that getting to the other side, we've got to take our colleagues, be it our council women, council men, physicians, community leaders, farmers, agriculturalists, those that are in the, um, the textile industry, the pharmaceutical in in industry. And so we've got to make sure that we take each other with us so that we can understand what the bigger good is, and that is to go. And so go is when you go and do something. And that's something that we all have the opportunity to do is be a starch and strong advocate for those that can't speak for themselves. 
And although we all come from very different backgrounds, I'm a surgeon, I had an opportunity to talk to a, a beautiful family medicine physician, our legal representatives and those that are in various industries, be it food or agriculture, the one thing that we all have in common, the glue that holds us all together, is that our desire to make an impact, to make an impact on lives other than ourselves. Because we have to understand that our gifts are not for us. And so how can we utilize our gifts in order to, to benefit those that are outside of ourselves? In terms of my background, so again, just remember in the back of your head, stop looking up. But in terms of my background, I trained at Grady Hospital, and although now I'm a surgeon that specializes in cancer, and I do cancer surgery, cancer reconstruction, while at Grady, I had lots of patients that suffer from sickle cell, which she mentioned with her husband having suffered from sickle cell, and um, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, trauma patients. The one thing they all had in common is this issue of chronic pain. And so I say in order for us to have a position, you have to be organized because you have to help add clarity to very complex issues. Now medicinal marijuana should not be a complex issue, but the culture and the society in which we live, there is some, some complexity there. There's a lot of moving parts. So I break it down with just the ABC. So the first thing in medicinal marijuana we've already done today, and that's just raising awareness. We need to raise awareness about what it is. Um, what marijuana is, is a type of medication or drug that's been used for thousands of years, since 3 BC. It's been listed in Indian journals, Chinese journals, American journals, English journals, and in terms of its utility, it was listed as one of the 50 fundamental Chinese medicines for over 3,000 years. So this is not a new concept in terms of how helpful it is, but it's incumbent upon us to help raise awareness. See, we're in a unique position in that we all know that it's effective. However, we have the, the pedigree and background that will compel people to listen. We have the pedigree and background that will compel people to listen. A lot of people that will benefit from it, they don't have the pedigree and background that will allow people to listen to what they have to say. And that's a huge responsibility. So again, raising awareness. The other thing that's important about awareness is knowing what some of the concerns of constituents of our legal community, the pharmaceutical community, our federal government, is whether or not there are detrimental side effects, if whether or not there have been overdoses from the cannabis plant itself. And what the research has shown is that there hasn't been any documented overdoses. And I can speak from a professional standpoint. And I took care of many people on the trauma service. I was trauma chief at Grady Hospital. So if you were shot or in an accident or sad in 2008, I was your surgeon. And so I had an opportunity to see a lot of pain and see a lot of patients that were treated for drug overdoses. So in America, drug overdoses are 44,000 a year of people dying from drug overdoses. Of that number, over half of that is from prescription drugs. That's 51%. Of that number, over 70% from opioids. Now, as a clinician, I prescribe opioids almost on a daily basis because I am a surgeon that does cancer. And oftentimes, those patients are in a great deal of pain, but I want to be able to give them other options other than the opioid use. In terms of the... Um, patients that have died from drug overdoses, compare that to cannabis, we've had 16,000 people to die from opioid overdoses. 16,000, 44 people a day. Of that number, cannabis overdoses, they have been able to find five globally, and of those five, none of them have been directly related to the overdose of cannabis, but aspiration. Aspiration is where uh, a patient will become intoxicated from other medications and can cannabis may have been included in that and they choke on their vomit and have different, they literally drown in the, um, in the vomitus. And that, those were the only five document cases. Those were not in the U.S., this was in Europe, uh, in the British Journal of Medicine. So again, there hasn't been any documented cases in the United States um, linking a cannabis overdose. So you compare zero to 44,000, I think that's a very significant number. So again, I just want to try to raise awareness of its usefulness and utility, but also um, 
discuss some of the side effects that we can educate people on that the side effects are far outweigh some of the potential risks that some of the opponents have mentioned. So some of the beneficial things I've Excuse seen... Me, I'm speak just yes. real quick. I have a, uh, a question from Representative Roger Bruce. Hi. Hello, hi, how are you? I'm good. Yeah. I'm always glad to, to hear anybody that had anything to do with Morehouse. Okay. That's my alma mater. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, but I do have a question. I'm glad sure. that you are here as a medical professional because that's the question that keeps coming up for, mm -hmm. for me. I, I, I'm not questioning the, the value of it or any of that kind of stuff. You know, sure. that's, if you say it's good, you're a doctor and you know, you know best. However, the question comes from the fact that it's not regulated Absolutely. anywhere. And the lack of the regulation on how it's made is what seems to be of concern because there's everybody, you make the stuff in the kitchen, at mm -hmm. the kitchen table, in the backyard, wherever. So if you have to prescribe this and then the patient has some other ailment that requires a different kind of medication, mm -hmm. how, how do you get comfortable with the two things interacting with each other without causing harm if you don't know what's in the other product? That's the question. Yeah, that's a great question. And so my B is behavior, and that was my next point. So I'm so glad you asked that question. So how do we set the, the political and... Um, I guess safety profile in terms of how can we teach clinicians how to modify their behavior so it's prescribed safely. And so usually with any medication is prescribed in a dose dependent fashion where you start out at a very low dose. And so most, may, most patients that are on any sort of medication, especially this particular type, if you're using it for pain specifically, it's a receptor called mu receptor and it specifically acts on that receptor. So you want to make sure that you have a list of all the medications that patients are on. Right now we have what we call electronic medical records. So any patient that has had any uh, drug prescribed to them by a physician is listed in a statewide database. So when a patient comes in to see me, I already know what they're on um, or what they've been prescribed the last 12 months. And so I'm able to look at that list and make sure that the medications that I'm prescribing won't act synergistically, meaning in a bad way where they can have a drug overdose from inability to breathe or things of that nature that can be problematic. So in terms of regulation, we need to practice our general medical principles. We wouldn't necessarily have to change anything that we're doing, but just raise an awareness to make sure you check the medication list, which we're now required to do and to make sure that the medications that we're prescribing aren't interacting with that list of medications. Yeah, just as a follow-up to that, I understand that. Mm -hmm. The problem is, I shouldn't say problem, the, the concern is, mm -hmm. is that you don't know what's in the cannabis oil because it's not, that's not regulated. Mm -hmm. So if, if a person in this state takes something and a person in another state is taking it, and it's made in two different places, but sure. I read that you don't know what's yeah. in it. And that's the goal, is to make sure that it is standardized, and at some point it will need to be regulated, because okay. it can't be the Wild Wild West. I mean, aspirin, if it were around, when the FDA were around, it would not have been approved, because of all the potential side effects. Um, so the goal is to make sure we set out guidelines. We can use Colorado as a president, or even California, where they have panels of physicians and pharmacists that can sit down and make sure that is standard and consistent because that's what makes it safe because right. you know what you're getting. And that's that's my concern. And until they do that, how how as a physician are you comfortable with telling somebody to take to, to use it and at the same time prescribing them something else if you don't know what it really is? Yeah, and that is that is a challenge, and that's why I think it's important that you have specialists that are trained and understand what we call complementary medicine. When I trained at MD Anderson, which is the number one cancer center in the world, they have a whole um, um, section just on complementary medicine. Complementary medicine is not just medicinal marijuana, but it's also um, uh, vitamins that patients are taking, other supplements. You can understand exactly what they're getting and try to complement that with what you're giving them. So the goal is to first do no harm. So to your point, I think it's really important that we have people that understand 
the pharmacology behind it and can set down guidelines so that we know what we're doing and how we're going about so we can still do it safely and effectively. Did that answer your question? I, I, I'll leave it alone, but okay. it's, it's still, it still gets me the point. Again, I'm not against the use of it. Sure. I'm just, I'm just trying to get comfortable until we go through the process that you just described mm -hmm. of making sure that it is consistent, that if you, you know, if, if you prescribe it, that it's the same thing no matter where it is. Exactly. Until that happens, I'm just concerned that we don't know what, mm -hmm. what it is. And by not going through the normal process of making sure that we identify all of the ingredients. So one of the ideas that we could consider um, is having source control, meaning having a list of, let's say, certified growers or certified um, manufacturers that you all have approved and vetted, and that, that those particular growers or distributors will agree to make sure it's a consistent formulation, and if they're not on that list of approved uh, manufacturers or growers, then it would not behoove a physician to prescribe it, right. um, because we just don't know where it's coming from. Exactly. And I completely agree with you on that. So, yeah, that would be my, my remedy, is to just have a, an approved list. Okay. Yeah. And so he already did the B, which is B, behavior. How do we organize this so it can be safely and effectively? And the last is just consumer choices. So again, we talked about awareness. Um, we talked about the behavior, how can we make sure this is appropriately regulated so it can be safe, and then lastly, consumer choices. So my goal as a surgical oncologist is not to say that I only want my patients to have cannabinoids, I just want them to be able to have an option so that it can be on the table. And I see patients anywhere from those that are early stage, which is 70% of my practice, to 30%, which is the, their terminal. And I've seen benefits on both sides. And we have a lot of discussions about the terminally ill patients, but I've also seen it in patients that just want to treat it, beat it, and move on. How can I continue teaching? How can I continue being a mom? How can I continue being um, um, an advocate in my home and in my community? So they want to be able to have decreased nausea, better pain control, and I don't want to have to be able to turn these patients away once they have run out of their, their options in terms of their narcotics. They want to be functional and increase their quality of life. So again, there's no one magic bullet to this. I, I agree um, with the gentleman to the right that we've got to have some sort of regulation, but I think change starts with having a conversation. So I'm so proud of you guys for at least organizing this conversation today. And hopefully from it, eventually we all will be on the right side of history. It's just a privilege to be a small part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very compelling testimony. Appreciate you being here today. Thank you.